Great. Well, I think, you know, next to climate change, there's probably no one issue that's going to define um, our society more in the coming era than how we adapt to um, our digital lives, expanding into every aspect of our lives. You all come at the question of cybersecurity from a different perspective, so I'm really excited to have each of you, and maybe you can talk a little bit about how you come at this, because obviously, Johan, you come at from the regulatory end, Martin, you've been in this field for a really long time, looking at it from the hacker's perspective, Axel, you know, helping companies see where they are and where they need to be, um, but maybe you can expand on that briefly in a minute or two. Axel, do you want to start? Okay. Yeah, we were... TIFSUIT was, was uh, founded more than 150 years ago, and the mission at that time was to protect people, assets, and the environment from negative effects of new technologies. 150 years ago, the latest and at that time most dangerous technology were steam boilers, and we were, so to say, founded to prevent them from exploding. And when you look today in technologies, uh, we are basically, we do services in all kinds of uh, technologies around the world with 25,000 people. And more and more of these technologies today and the function of those, especially on the safety side, are today defined by software. So and then, of course, you're very fast in uh, thinking about how can you prevent these latest technologies from being intruded by cyber hacks and so on, what we will be talking about. And that is how we came to the topic. So cybersecurity is one of our major focus topics of our strategic um, visions of the next years. And we'll get more into the supply sure. chain and how you do that. Yep. Johan, where is the role for regulatory to play and how do you, your agency come at this? The topic of this conference is what are you adding? And what the EU Agency for Cybersecurity is adding is trust. And we do that not alone, but together with member state authorities and community at large uh, through different ways. For example, uh, through certification so that uh, uh, producers and vendors can demonstrate transparently what types of measures they have taken in order to make their uh, ICT products, services, or even processes cybersecure. Uh, and that it comes to everyday products like you buy a router in order to create a Wi-Fi in your ho home or you as a SME want to engage with a cloud service provider. So I think these kind of measures, but there are also technologies out there who are still developing. Uh, and for that, certification is not the answer. So what we do is also, together with the community, uh, we uh, promote uh, security by design, and risk management approaches. We, we do uh, baselines in order to, uh, for these types of products to, to have a checklist of uh, what can be done in order to uh, create trust in the products and, and these new types of services. I mean, there was a good panel about uh, automotive industry. A modern car is not just a car, it's uh, an IoT on wheels. Sure. And it has 100 million lines of code. You can't certify the security of this code, but what it can do is to make sure that the car manufacturer applies risk management approaches. So that's Great. essentially, I think, what the, what the regulators are doing. Martin, you've obviously been in this field for a long time, but I suspect uh, the amount of devices that you're having to look at is growing. It is growing, but uh, so is the number of hackers. And, and I'm here to represent the hackers. We hack for good, and we fix your systems by detecting the flaws for you. We have 600,000 eager cybersecurity experts who are ready to de be deployed on a moment's notice. And there is this old fallacy in cybersecurity that people are the problem and tech is the solution. It's exactly the opposite. Technology is our problem, and humans are the solution. And wherever we go in cybersecurity, whether it's phishing or it's software with vulnerabilities or it's people being sloppy with their, their uh, passwords and so on, uh, the solution to it is to get people engaged and understanding. And just like we all had to learn to disinfect our hands when we enter a hospital, and just like we all had to learn to go through security check when we board a, before we board a plane, in the same way, we must all take action 
to increase cybersecurity and reduce the risk of breach. And there's no technology that will solve it, never. It's only humans who can solve the problem. If each of you had to give society a grade on how ready we are for the world that we're creating from a security perspective, uh, in the States we grade from A to F with A being the best, uh, where are we today? <laughs> God, that's a very difficult question to answer. I think it's also it's much more complex and multi-layered than we uh, than we can describe. I think that was a, I think it was a very good parallel. You know, technology is a problem and humans are the solution. But also, you can argue it's not so black and white. I mean, there are a lot of technologies out there that can be applied and used in order to make cybersecurity uh, through product development part of the product. Uh, encryption is a very good example of this. If you look at the issues in the cybersecurity at large, I mean, one of the biggest issues is cyber hygiene. Uh, the way that the attack happen, the, the vectors that are used by cyber criminals, it's not something extremely sophisticated. It's old school phishing attacks. It's sending a false email and people clicking on it. It's about what the introduction was. Uh, using and uh, reusing the passwords one two three four. So oh, I, I added a five. <laughs> no one will guess it. It's now one two three four five. So I'm your cyber secure. Uh, so these kind of things. But it's also about the system architecture. There are systematic issues there. There are issues technology strategic that go beyond this. So the complexity of it is something that I think we still need to grapple with. So it would be very hard to. To, to mark it. Let's well, maybe asking for a grade is the wrong idea, unless one of you want to give it a grade. But the reason I was starting there was, and I just got back from CES, and I was actually going to give us, as a society and as an industry, a very poor grade. And here's why. There were a million new products ready to come into the smart home, if you will. Uh, you know, toothbrushes, uh, vacuum machines. And my sense is that from what I've learned about cybersecurity, things are only as secure as the weakest link. And the competition I saw was a lot of products that want to be that weakest link. Uh, I can only imagine, you know, if we were to bring in these products, um, and obviously you, you guys do a lot of work certifying them, you do work regulating them, you do work helping in the companies insure them. Um, but my sense is neither on the home side or on the business side, obviously business takes it more seriously, are we really that prepared? What's missing from the conversation and how important are these weakest links? As you point out, sometimes it's the human. In the phishing email, it's not the devices, it's actually the human giving away the password. I mean, the, the interesting thing is when you talk about the weakest link is that I think also consumers have the feeling there seems to be a lot of weak links. I mean, we had this panel just before about uh, smart homes. Yeah. And I mean, we did a, we, we asked consumers and 70% of those whom we asked said we will never let a smart home enter, so to say, our home because we don't trust the suppliers of these smart homes. So, and yet the TV they buy, whether uh, they want it or not, And yet it comes is. to transparency. They not even know that they already have these smart appliances already at home. They cannot say no to them because they, they bought a smart home and uh, it is a smart uh, TV. And it's uh, damn hard for them to switch the smart um, uh, services off. Very hard. They just don't know how to do it. And I think here it comes then to what you said. It's a matter of trust. And unless you have the trust in a product which you use at home, you will not uh, have it. I think there is a scope for regulators to act as well and uh, importantly to push for these prudent risk management approaches in the product development cycle and also when they are put on the market. We've looked in Europe in the critical infrastructure. We have a framework in place there. Now we do something on certification. But there are new areas evolving day by day as we speak. And I think looking at these areas also and acknowledging the cybersecurity component of these areas is very important. And that's what I think the, uh, the approach of, uh, of the new European Commission vis-à-vis uh, -vis the IoT, but also the artificial intelligence. I think it is essentially, you know, we need to have a checklist ready before these products hit the market. We need to have an understanding what, what does it mean when you say risk-based approach? What is the commonality there? And we've been coupling with this for a year now in Europe with the 5G. Where 
they put together a common risk assessment of there are more than 100 assets in 5G that needs to be secured. And I want to dive in on 5G for a second, yeah. and then we'll get to you, Martin, um, because it is a real big debate on how to make sure these networks are secure. And I come from the U.S., and in the U.S., it seems like the answer and question is, did it come from China? If so, it's not secure. If it came from anywhere else, great, it's secure. Europe's taken a different approach. Um, how important are the geopolitics in this, and are you, do you feel like in Europe you're able to get past that and look at the security concerns more specifically, or is the U.S. right to say Huawei represents the security threat, and if we just ban Huawei, we have secure 5G networks? Uh, I'm going back to your previous question. I think the ship is already turning, and it's getting better but it will get worse before it get be gets better. But we see it's getting better because the young generation, they get this. It's us adults and old people who, who don't get cybersecurity, but the young do. The second thing is regulation, that politicians and legislators are actually pioneers in cybersecurity. And GDPR is not, it's, it's about privacy and not cybersecurity, but it's an example of how society will vote through uh, legislative measures to, to demand everybody to live up to a new standard. And this will happen across the whole world. And at that point, there will always be trade wars between whoever is winning and whoever is losing. And it, it, right now it looks like the US and China, but there will always be somebody who is doing it. But it, it, it shouldn't, I mean, cyber policy and trade wars should be separate. They've become one, but I, I, my suspicion, on is that that's not the right way uh, to well, look but, at it. But politicians are just like criminals. Criminals uh, do cybercrime because that's the, where the money is. And politicians uh, do cyber policy because that's where the power is. So they will absolutely go there and move the trade wars into the digital domain. And we, and we can't really stop that. But, but through, through regulation, we can build a solid foundation and through openness and transparency, we can make sure that everybody competes on the same grounds. And at that point, it matters less whether it's a Chinese vendor or not. I feel like I will, I, I, I'm bound to contradict you every time. <laughs> Please, I work do. with loads yes, of politicians, <laughs> and none of them are criminals. <laughs> but at least I don't know that they are. And I think, going back to the question, I think it was the issue there is that Europe has taken a risk-based approach. We've, we try to understand what are the risks out there and what would be the different measures that we need to roll out in order to mitigate these risks. And of course, they are at the strategic and technological level or operational level or regulatory level or political level as well. Um, and they require different tools. And I think uh, in the European context as well, the member states have very, very different legacy systems when it comes to their telecommunication networks. Uh, and most of the 5G, which is piloted now, rests upon the legacy system. So there is no single way how to approach these risks. Um, and that's the beauty of the toolbox. It gives you a number of tools to choose from, but the tools are themselves coordinated with other member states so that it reduces fragmentation or potential fragmentation so that when we roll out these measures, the 5G can be more trustworthy vis-a-vis uh, the developers of the services or the, or the uh, producers, uh, but also increasingly and importantly vis-a-vis -vis the consumers. Now is the time to act. The, the, the toolbox, the 5G toolbox, is going to be finalized in the coming weeks. It's really up to the member states how they use this toolbox. Uh, the so the toolbox won't say Huawei good, Huawei bad, right? It won't say that. Yeah. Uh, because it's not about one single vendor. Mm -hmm. It is really about the ecosystem and the different layers in the ecosystem. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's up to the member states to make their own risk assessment, what kind of measures they need to uh, put in place in order to deal with these risks. And actually, you have a unique viewpoint because you're seeing a lot of the components, a lot of the individual pieces of the supply chain. What does it look like from your perspective, whether it be 5G or IoT? What are you seeing on the security side? I think what we, what we still see is it starts from the top. The, the aspect of cybersecurity in the company, and let's come back a little bit from politics to reality in our companies, this aspect has to be the highest potential of the C-level, of the board. Otherwise, there will be no budgets 
There will be no actions uh, taken to prevent the company be, to be attacked and use maybe products which are not, not, uh, not secure. And I can give you a good example. We, we did uh, two years ago, we did a, or tried to, to do a, a conference on, on cybersecurity and we call it, uh, in German it was called cybersecurity is Chefsache, so it's a uh, it, it's matter of, of the sea level. Cybersecurity is a matter of sea level. And we did it in cooperation with the German Association of, of, of Business. And we had a very large uh, number of, of companies being um, uh, invited. And of course, we, we wrote the letters or the emails to, to the sea level. And actually, there were 3,500 companies being invited, small, medium sized companies, especially. And out of these 3,500 companies, 35 appeared. And I was the only sea level there. The rest were IT people. And, and that it shows a little bit the, the awareness in, in companies that, that the management is still not really in a position to see the risk, as you say. This, this risk aspect is still not really um, in, in the awareness. And I feel, oh, go ahead. If I may, I mean, it is really one of the biggest issues out there. I mean, if you, if you look at the preparedness of companies, some of the big companies are ready, but if you go to the mid level and small level, it's not yet there. I think it's not yet acknowledged that cybersecurity is not an IT problem. It's a problem which goes to the core business of the company. If your databases are hacked or hijacked, and you don't know who your clients are, or where in the development cycle your products now are, or your IP rights are stolen, it is not about IT issue. It is who you are. And I think this acknowledgement that the top level is not yet there when we, when we look at the private sector. And I, I do. I, my sense is that it's still viewed as a nice to have. The big companies know their business is at stake. The small and medium companies probably know that at a certain level, but they're just trying to get the product out the door. They're trying to get V1. They're trying to do whatever. Same on the consumer side. I know it's important. I mean, even if you look at this room, I think a lot of people decided lunch was more important than cybersecurity. Uh, and that's but a problem. But a lot of people didn't. Uh, thank you <laughs> to all of you who know that cybersecurity <laughs> is more important than lunch. Because lunch will still be there when we get done. But, I mean, that really is always my sense. And I've covered tech for 20 years. And I think that, you know, security is important. I mean, you, you talked about it. If you can sell something, it's important. Um, but I think this idea that it has to be first and foremost. How do we shift that conversation? How do we get every, everyone to give up lunch and come uh, talk cybersecurity? So well, next one year. One thing we need to do is uh, promote younger people into more senior positions because it is a generational thing and the young generation gets it. There, there should be no difference between leading a business and understanding the digital domain because every business is or will be in the digital domain. So it's an essential skill of any CEO. And, and we get there by promoting the young people, and we get there by setting really hard fines for violations. And GDPR does it. Data breach uh, costs are enormous. And, and that is the very physical way of teaching a company how to handle it. And we will have a lot of breaches a lot of bad things happening on the way there, but it will happen. But one of the things what, that we can do is essentially what you do, you hack. Huh? Yes. But can you hack, I mean, in some national regulations, it's still illegal to, they don't have this kind of a uh, voluntary vulnerability disclosure policies in place which would allow people like you or academia or researchers yeah. to voluntarily look into vulnerabilities in the system and then report it in the secure way. Uh, I mean. This is also part of it, to, to be more transparent about the risks, so also to have the environment where the risks can yep. be discussed well, in a secure but, but And that's why hack, Martin... We hack all over the US, we hack the Pentagon, the Army, the Air Force, we hack the UK government... You might UK be Commission. in trouble if you be very... But most no, of the time, Martin, Martin, I, so it's I don't think most people know how it works. In most no. of the cases, you're invited in, right? Yes. They're actually paying you we, to hack the we system. We only hack on invitation. Right. Yes, so, we're, for those that don't know ideas. Hacker One, um, yes, it's an army of hackers, but companies are paying, and they're not paying by the hour, they're paying for success. Talk just for a moment, because we don't have a ton of time, but yeah. explain for a moment that model and how it's worked, because it's fascinating. Yeah, so we run a program called Hack the Pentagon, where we hack the Pentagon. And um, certain hackers are 
allowed into this, the program and they look for ways to break in. We broke into the Air Force in eight minutes. And then based on how serious the hole is, they pay a, a bounty that's high or low. And then they make money here. And in the Hack the Air Force program, our best hacker was Jack Cable. He's from Chicago. He was all of 17 years old when he did it. And he found 20 ways to get into the Air Force's systems. And he's 17. And then we know that it's not a question of university education or anything like that, because at 17, you don't have that. It's uh, the mindset of those who grew up in the digital world. Most of us are digital immigrants. We were born in a non-digital land, and then we moved into a digital one uh, 10, 20 years ago. But they grew up there, they can break in, and then they get paid for their fines, which is when you can fix it. So it is the immunization of the internet, the, the vaccine of the internet. You use a little bit of the bad to create uh, resilience against the true breaches. That's, that's how it works. And, and, the, and the we have 600,000 of them. So we can, we can hack you, just, just let me know. I think it's a great thing, but I mean, on the other side of it is the security by design, security by default policies. Right. That I think, yeah, most product designers are also digital immigrants. They don't see cybersecurity as something that is intrinsic in the product development cycle. They see something that, ah, after I develop my product, I will add it on. It's like I package it in the cybersecurity. But we had the same, we had the same way, with yeah. hospitals. When they learned that by washing your hands, fewer children will die. How long did it take for society to implement hygiene in hospitals? 20 years, 30 years, 50 years? I, I wasn't there, but it took a long, long time. But these kind of practices can be put in the regulatory framework. And I think you can promote also measures that are voluntary and measures that where the industry can come together and, and see what is the best way forward in order for us to actually promote this. But I heard two things that I want to follow up. One, your point that it has to be by design. It, it just doesn't work. And Microsoft learned that the hard way. Uh, when Windows was dominant and there were all these security bugs, they actually had to stop what they were doing and rethink the way they engineered it. And I think they're a real success story for the large part this week's huge Windows hole that the NSA uncovered notwithstanding. Um, does the way that you test and certify need to change? Or is it changing? How is it changing? Um, are you hiring hackers? Is Martin uh, attacking all your products that come in for testing? Yeah, we, of course, we have also hackers. We have worldwide not 600,000, uh, but we have own hackers, and that is the difference, yeah? Because we have certain quality levels which we can best control when we have the people on their own payroll. Therefore, we have only 35. What we, what you, what we do in addition is that, of course, we have many technical systems which are industries, and maybe, we, maybe you can also talk about cars. You mentioned that in the beginning. When you have a car today, of course, the car is delivered to the customer on the first day with a certain software. But then you have hundreds of uh, updates over the air, over the years. Yeah? So what, what is then the software below the metal sheet in that specific car? And therefore, uh, we, we tend to think that, of course, at the end of the day, for the very high, high risky things, you need specialists who have a last look at it. But this 24-7 security monitoring, I think that is something which must be the basis. All these IT systems, uh, operational uh, systems in the automation of um, uh, critical infrastructures, for instance, in hospitals and all this, has to be supervised 24-7. It is not sufficient, like in the past, that our business model has been, in many cases still it is, that an auditor, an inspector of ours goes into a company and looks at it every year or every six months, whatever. And that, of course, in the age of software, with constant software updates, improving the firmware, is, of course, something of yesterday. And that changes our business model dramatically. The big elephant, of course, out there is liability. Oh, what yeah. is the incentive of companies to actually do that? You, you, you see that there are sectors out there where liability has been ingrained into the product development. I mean, mentioned health, but also transport, etc. Digital services and products are not known for this. And especially in the US, and a lot of these come from the US. Like, my sense is every, every brand out there has been hacked. Everyone's breached my data. And so the consequences have been pretty low, and we don't have a very good fine system. They don't, they, you know, sign me up for a year of free credit monitoring. 
Uh, I have more years of free credit monitoring than I have left on Earth, but I don't have secure information. And I think that, that, that actually poses a, a quantum for regulators, whether to, whether to enlarge in the scope of, of liability or not. And of course, there are a number of uh, ways you can incentivize uh, the community. And it's true as well that putting the blame on only one uh, piece of the value chain or one part of the value chain might not be right because it's the overall ecosystem. We talked about smart cars, but it's not really only about the car. It's the environment around the self-driving car. It's potentially also the kind of gadgets that the user of this car uses within this car. So it is wider than just one, but I think there is a debate there that needs to be discussed at the regulatory level. I don't know where the outcome is, but I think you, you can't put it in, in the box and say it doesn't exist. And if I may add, I mean, we have now the European Cybersecurity Act, and there are these three levels of basics this, and uh, substantial and uh, high risk yes. things. And we definitely need now a decision which products belong to which of these levels. Because otherwise, those who produce products, but especially those who want to use these products at the end, they don't have a clue how these have to be tested, can be tested, what can be done. And that is a very, very intransparent situation right now. And don't most of them, I mean, obviously, healthcare, there's all these that come to mind as the highest level, but it strikes me as any device that goes into that hospital is actually at the highest level, because that we get back to that whole weakest yeah, link thing. It is supposed to be, but when you look at reality and we look at the European uh, medical um, regulation, then of course there is a new regulation. But we just published actually guidelines. Yeah, guide that for the first time ever, the yeah, MRI guidelines. that are uh, produced and uh, puts in the hospital, they need to be cyber secure. So, um, and, and I think health But what that means is not written into that guideline, and that is a little bit the problem right now, and that has to be elaborated. I mean, there is a learning curve there, but exactly. I think it's not, uh, at least what I see in European ecosystem or regulatory ecosystem, the measures are there, the tools are there. It's the question of how do we use these tools mm -hmm. and whether right. these have already right. been rolled out or right. not. Yeah. So we've kept everyone from their lunch for quite a while, but um, what I wanted to ask you in the last couple minutes that we have, what is missing, not just from our discussion here, because that's good and important, but what's missing from the broader discussion? What aren't we talking about enough when it comes to cybersecurity? Well, one thing is that uh, people hope that there would be some 100% secure environment where nothing bad can ever happen. And we've practically gotten there with aviation safety and others. But in cybersecurity, we'll never get the cyber risk down to zero. There will always be risk. And, and so it means that our focus must be on the speed of recovery when something happens. Of course, we must try to avert breaches as much as we can. But statistically, we need to be ready that bad things will happen. And then it's a question of speed of reaction, speed of recovery. And security then becomes a practice of doing things quickly and not trying to achieve some goal that's unachievable. Yuan, I mean, obviously there's a bunch of regulations that are coming and things that have happened. What, what do you feel like is still missing uh, from the policy perspective? Or what do you think policy can't solve that business or consumers should be taking on more? Well, like Axel said about the continuous monitoring, we must... I'm sure you must regulate it in some areas and say certain vendors must have continuous monitoring and a continuous ability to fix. Yeah. I mean, there's always an issue in politics, which is what is the scope of action and what is the focus of action? And I think we always need to evaluate whether the scope and the focus is right for the right time, but also how to do that in a way that is future-proof. And, and that's a trickier question because you might overextend yourself. And that's the issue of, you know, also... Uh, there is an investment and a cost for the society to create uh, redundancies in you know, order to make sure that if something happens, then you can speedily recover. If you create redundancies in all of these areas, that will also incur a cost. So you need to be proportionate about what you do and not. And measuring it is a tricky way. So I, I don't have an answer, but I think that's why I like politicians, because they, they need to find an outcome. Axel, I'll give you the last word. Yeah, for me, thank you. For me, for me the most um, important thing, and we talked about it, is education of individuals, but also of companies, what might happen and what, what these digital technologies might mean for their risks. And um, that also um, can help then that we understand, as Martin correctly said, 
there will be no, no world with 100% security. That will never happen again. And uh, that is something which has, has to be educated. But does it mean for society? Well, I hope we've whetted your appetite a little bit, both uh, for lunch and for the importance of cybersecurity. Um, if you enjoyed my moderating, I do a daily newsletter for Axios. You can get it at getlogin.axios.com. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.